Good afternoon, Roy Oppenheim here for our 23rd consecutive week at Zoom at noon. Uh, this week, we're going to have Ido Alexander, a good friend who's also partners with, with Zach Shulman, who's been a guest on the show. We're going to be talking about strategic uses of bankruptcy when foreclosure and a, an eviction moratoria are lifted. Um, this week, as usual, we will be talking about uh, the weekly economic update. We're going to look at the pandemic and where it sits, and then we're going to look at strategic uses of bankruptcy as it relates to everything that we're all going through. As you all know, our law firm and title company have been sponsoring these uh, Zooms at noon now, again, for our 23rd week in a row. Our law firm has been representing the South Florida community for, for 30 years. We were deep in the trenches during the last economic foreclosure crisis. And once again, we find ourselves in a similar situation deep in the trenches, but this time representing not just folks in foreclosure, but representing landlords and tenants and businesses and everyone who's trying to figure out how we're going to come out of this uh, stronger and, and better. And that's why we have Ito today to talk about how bankruptcy is an important component of, of, of that. Uh, as usual, our, our team, Ellen Polelski, my wife and partner, who's, who's very helpful in putting this together, Jeff Sherman, who's also directing today, Mia Singh, uh, my senior associate, and Paula Vergara, who is of, of counsel. And also I wanna thank uh, Lance Oppenheim for uh, putting helping putting this presentation together today also. In terms of, uh, Ido Alexander, I just want to go over his background briefly. Briefly, Ido practices uh, bankruptcy law. He represents trustees, debtors, and creditors. He serves as the uh, has served as the past president of the Bankruptcy Bar Association of South Florida, and Ido is a frequent speaker on bankruptcy topics. And he's received a Distinguished Service Award by the Bankruptcy Bar Association of the Southern District of Florida. And Ido, if, if you can. Can you see Ido? Anyway, uh, he's on mute. Ido, we'll bring you in in a few minutes, but uh, I'm glad you, you've joined us. Thank you. So let, let's jump to the weekly economic update. There are a lot of interesting issues I, I want to address. If we go to the next slide. Um, slide six, thank you. Uh, big headline this past week in the Wall Street Journal is that retail spending in July has actually reached or topped pre-pandemic levels. And if we take a look, we can see how that is happening because it's kind of fascinating. Uh, while there's so many people who are unemployed at 10.2% currently, uh, and you have uh, so many businesses that, that are not making it, we're still seeing that retail sales are starting to increase. If we take the cursor, we can see that, um, go back, sorry. If we take the cursor, we can see that uh, right in, in March, the economic spending completely dropped off and then has quickly come back up and is now in excess of where it, it previously was. Um, if we go to the next slide. Uh, we can see uh, how in-store spending on credit cards has, uh, has changed from a year ago. And, and as we, we can see that there was this massive spike uh, right before the crisis and the shutdowns. And that's a function of the fact that uh, people were, were, were basically accumulating stuff because they knew they wouldn't be able to go out. You had this precipitous drop. And then we had uh, a slow incremental increase that, that again continued to uh, incremental increase that, that continued to uh, go up and down because uh, what we had was the economy opening and closing based on, on the pandemic in, in particular regions of, of, of the country. And so right now, what we're seeing is that uh, sales are continuing to come back, but, but they're still uh, somewhat below where, where they were when it comes to in-store spending. Uh, next page, we're seeing a, a, a recent uh, seen in New York City in front of J.J. Crew that has gone bankrupt. I think this is on Fifth Avenue and it's, it's, it's somewhat, uh, you know, a ghostly uh, kind of characterization of sorts. Uh, page 11, uh, what we're seeing here is a change in sales from January of the different sectors. And, and, and of course, if we go to the bottom one, the bottom blue one, we can see how grocery, excuse me, uh, uh, it, clothing uh, actually dropped dramatically, but then has increased and increased back to levels that actually are higher than they were before the, the pandemic. Uh, bars and restaurants are yellow, right? Uh, they actually dropped, but have not been able to come back because of, of the restrictions on, on social distancing. Non-store retailers, such as Amazon, we see have obviously continues to do well. It's leveled off a little bit. Groceries peaked and then leveled off as uh, bars and restaurants started coming back. And so we're starting to see a convergence of, of the mean, which is the, the dotted line, but what we're seeing is non-store retailers will continue to probably be stronger than before. 
and groceries will probably remain stronger than, than before too. And clothing is kind of interesting. I guess people just just you know need to spend money on, on something. Um, next page. Uh, a new kind of recession. I, I think if we look at these charts here, we see existing home sales, which is interesting, have dropped and, and are starting to come back pretty ferociously, but they're not coming back to the same levels that they were because so many people are not listing their homes and because there's a shortage of inventory. And there's right now a seller's market because those people who do want homes and want to have a lot of people, more social distancing in their homes, there, there's not that much inventory for that right now. And so what we're seeing is, is less uh, activity than there was prior to uh, the pandemic. Retail sales, and this is, this is a perfect example, we're seeing this big chasm, this huge V that occurred, and they were talking about, you know, would there be a V recovery? And to some extent, you, you visually see the V right there, which is just remarkable, and it's come back to, to very much to where levels were before the pandemic. So the question is, when the pandemic's over, will there be in, in a form of inflation? Will there be uh, so much new activity because people want to go out or, or will things just remain at, at, at the levels they are or will we actually have a recession a true recession beyond the unemployment that we're having now where consumer spending starts to roll back and activity stops and uh, economist steve blitz said it best probably the real recession has yet to emerge and will emerge when the long-term repercussions of the current situation are felt and i'm not sure when that's going to be is it going to be in six months going to be a year or two years so that's kind of an interesting prop. But of course, the overlay is that you have a 10.2% level of unemployment, a level of unemployment that hasn't been seen literally since the Great Depression. And we have a, a very combative election that's coming up. And so all these things are going to have uh, a unique impact on the economy and are going to cause, unfortunately, more economic failures and probably a lot more bankruptcies. In terms of the pandemic, uh, the good news for Florida is that we've seen, if we look at the red here, a, a big drop off on the number of new cases. Uh, deaths actually have risen a bit, but that's because the deaths occur usually weeks after a peak. So these deaths now really reflect more the peak of, a, of, of several weeks ago. So as the number of new cases drop, we do expect the number of deaths to also drop. Also, we're seeing in South Florida that there are hot spots now in the, in the Panhandle and other areas, and we're going to see more of that as, as schools re reopen. Um, so just in the last few days, there have been 107 new, new virus deaths, uh, you know, uh, Deaths from, from the, the pandemic, 3,700 new cases were reported in Florida just on August 16th. Uh, that's an, a, a, over the past week, there's been an average of 5,801 new cases per day, but that's still a decrease of 36%. And so as of Monday morning, there have been around over a half million cases in Florida, and yet we're still below 10,000 deaths, thank God, that, that other states have seen over the past several weeks. Uh, where new cases are increasing around the country, uh, U.S. Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, they've been doing pretty well for a while. Now they're starting to see a spike. Uh, uh, other parts of the, of the heartland, North Dakota, Kansas also, Illinois, now Hawaii, uh, Delaware, a little bit, South Dakota, Guam, and even, even Vermont. Next page. And uh, where new cases are mostly the same, Georgia and Idaho, California, a lot of the states are, are, are holding their own. New York and New Jersey, things are holding their own. They, they suffered terribly, and so fortunately they, they've been able to, to hang on. And where cases are getting better. The next slide is interesting. We see that Florida finally is uh, where it, it should be, and that is with cases coming down, which is which is great news. Uh, in terms of uh, strategic uses of bankruptcy, I want to bring Ito on specifically. Ito, are you there? Let me get you on, buddy. And uh, I want to start with uh, with this new slide, if 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 we can. Ito, are you there? Yes, I am. I'm uh, trying to. There you go. Yeah, you look great. Hi, so, I'm so glad you could join us, thank you. I, I want you just to see this slide, and then, I'll, then I'm gonna start asking you some questions or vice versa. Uh, what we're seeing here is uh, um, the year-to-date of, of, of the, the value of real estate investment trusts, which is a, a, basically almost a way to see which areas of real estate are doing well and poorly, and a function and predicting of which areas of real estate will cause a lot of foreclosures and, of course, bankruptcies. So we're seeing that industrial real estate, of course, is doing quite well because of warehousing, but we also see at the same time that hotel, resort, and leisure is doing terribly, and that retail is doing, doing quite poorly, and uh, office and residential, so-so. In, in terms of new bankruptcies, Edo, I think we, we even talked about this morning, you know, Steinmart announced uh, yesterday Pizza Hut this, this morning. You know, we understand that the Cheesecake Factory, Denny's, Outback, Outback Steakhouse, and even Dave and Buster's will we'll all probably be filing very soon. So the question is, what does that mean for the little guy? What does that mean for small and mid-sized businesses? And what are you seeing in terms of your practice? 
So it's, it's a very, it's a, it's a big question to unpack there. Um, I, I want to comment. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for bringing uh, me on your show. I appreciate it uh, very much on behalf of myself and the firm of uh, Leader Michel and Alexander and some of you. Um, I want to reference something before we start talking about your curve, but if you look closely, it looks like almost like two divergent uh, factors here. You have industrial going up, you have hotels and other sectors going down. And that goes into some of what you touched on is the economic recession that everybody's been talking about. Various levels are floating out. You remember Roy W, V, uh, Nike swoosh. Do you remember that? And the most recent letter that uh, I've come across is the K. And what we see here is, is the K, which I think is on a micro level to specifically to real estate. You see some of that here with industrial going up while the hotel, um, specifically a hotel, is going down. Uh, other ones are pretty much in an in, in autopilot mode to some degree. They've taken a hit, uh, but I think a large percentage of the decline in residential office and retail is really a, a sub, sub, really attributed to one thing, which is the unknown, the uncertainty that's out there in the market, uh, in that nobody really knows when we're going to emerge out of this. Um, many of the retail bankruptcies that have taken place, um, you'll notice that many of those are retail establishments. Many of those were already brick and mortar that were already uh, pre pandemic uh, struggling uh, as it was because of the Amazon. Yeah, 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 I don't mean to cut you off, but some of the, the participants are saying that there's an echo on your mic. If you could maybe just speak a little closer, I think it's just, right, it's let just me, uh, for... thank you. I appreciate that. Let there me uh, change. That, Can you hear me now? Is yeah, better? much better. Much better. Okay. Much better. I'm sorry for interrupting. Um, Go ahead. No, no, it's, it's okay. So um, when we're looking at what's happening here, it's uh, much of that is if you're looking at it, it went down, but then it's sort of staying at the same levels. And a large percentage of that has to do with the uncertainty on the market. Um, as I was starting to say before, you have many large retail bankruptcies that are now occurring. And if you go back pre-pandemic, many of those same establishments, uh, Sears, J.C. Penney, uh, to name a few, were already um, having difficult times. And the reason for that was very simple. The brick and mortar model was no longer working very well. You had a migration more to the online and the pandemic almost came in and gave it that final push into uh, bankruptcy. Um, and why bankruptcy? Well, a big tool in the bankruptcy process is the ability to reject contracts and specifically reject leases. So these big, uh, brick and mortar locations that are now a large percentage of their expenditures are tied to their physical location are filing bankruptcy in an effort to shed many of these uh, costs for stores that are non-performing. And this is a great opportunity to get rid of a 15-year lease for a large shopping center uh, location that a TJ Maxx, for example, that's a bad example, I don't think they file for it. Uh, JC Penney, for example, for one of those locations, they can now reject those leases and find themselves in a position where they can streamline themselves to more profitable brick and mortar locations as well as their online presence. Right? And that's what it looks like. Many so of those are all revolving around real estate rejection of leases. Okay, so let's talk about we have these large, large retailers, some of them are public companies that are, that are going, going bankrupt. What impact does that have as a ripple effect to the distributors, their advertisers, uh, the folks that, that, that provide janitorial services, the folks that are, have been providing supplies and services and, and goods that haven't been paid? I mean, won't that cause a cataclysmic kind of reaction where other folks will then file bankruptcy because it's like a set of dominoes? Absolutely. Um, and it's already occurring, but it's, we're going to see it on a much more delayed reaction, mostly because of the government aid that's flooded the market. Money right now, uh, money obviously is cheap. Uh, the government flooded with between the PPP loans, the Payment, Payroll Protection Payment Act, um, between the uh, emergency economic disaster loans, and all other types of financial assistance that's out there. It's created a situation where we're not going to see those effects until much later. Um, I, I can give you sort of my own estimate, but that's just me looking at 
the limited data that I have um, and having talked about uh, with between other attorneys, yourself as well, Roy, uh, I think we're looking at uh, January, February of 2021. Well, everyone says it's going to be, you know, going to be after November, and I don't know what's so special about November, but everyone says it's going to be after November. So at least we have a few weeks to breathe until then. <laughs> at least until November, exactly. Uh, but there, there certainly is going to be a delayed reaction here, and many vendors are either scrambling to try to stabilize their ship, uh, quote unquote, uh, trying to figure out how they're going to do without uh, a new customer that they previously service. Uh, can they do without it? Um, and a big issue that sort of repeats itself for uh, companies of all sizes is the recognition that with a loss of revenue, there needs to be a bigger macro view of how we're going to proceed. And this is something that I'm sure, Roy, you've seen again, time and again, and I've seen it on my end, and that is the recognition that I need to see uh, counsel early enough and, and discuss how to proceed before it's too late. So I want, I want you to look at the next slide because it's really fascinating because, uh, and Jeff and I were just looking at this, uh, Jeff Sherman and I were looking at this right, right before we started. And if we look at this slide, we're seeing this huge, huge increase in the number of people that are 90 days late 30 and 60 days late, but particularly 90 days late, and are already in foreclosure. And if we take a look at that number and we extrapolate it back in time, we're going back to right where we were in 2008 when the crisis started, began, okay? And so we're seeing right now, visually, the tip of an iceberg of what is going to be a foreclosure and eviction tsunami that ultimately will only be stopped by lawyers, government programs, and bankruptcy. And so I want to talk a little bit about how bankruptcy right now can help folks that are going to be in foreclosure or that are, are looking at, at eviction as a method in which to try and reorganize, forestall, and figure out, you know, how to get out of this, this pickle. So I, I don't know if the word stall is the most appropriate word as much as uh, consolidate. I said, I said forestall. I said forestall, not stall. Uh, forestall. Yeah, yeah. Forestall. So, Big difference. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. I, I think, like you said, we are on the cusp of my side. The question is, what, what happens next? Once foreclosures will start happening, evictions in mass are going to start happening, bankruptcy does come in as a useful tool in allowing the person to, at a minimum, put a hit a pause button immediately. So as soon as you file the bankruptcy, you can hit a pause button, at least whether it be a very slow period, or can you hear me? Yeah, it's a little difficult. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Bad echo, hard to understand him. I'm going to try to switch to a different mic. Um, let me see if this works. Me, can you hear me now? Is this better? Yeah, that's better. That's better. That's better. Um, I have two mics, and I think that's what's happening here. They're competing with one another. But thank you very much for one of the audience members uh, that uh, just pointed that out. Um, what we're going to see with this tsunami is there's going to start, there are going to be evictions in mass foreclosures in mass. And what does bankruptcy do? Bankruptcy allows the person to really aim for either a plan of rehabilitation where they get to pay their debts through a plan or in the alternative. And that would be a chapter 13 under a chapter seven, liquidate themselves, but put themselves in a position where they can have a fresh start similar to at the end of the process of a payment plan with a chapter 13. So either a chapter seven, a liquidation, and immediately a fresh start or a chapter 13 payment plan and a fresh start, but it's important to sort of note and look at the most critical part. And that is at the moment that you file, um, what happens is there's a concept called the automatic stay. And as soon as we file that bankruptcy petition, there's a stop to everything that's happening. Now the question is what happens the next day after we file? Can the person that's just filed, can they, cure what's been owed in the past to the landlord and be able to stay on the property? Can they negotiate as part of their pro the process and the bankruptcy um, a solution with their landlord? But what bankruptcy provides is another tool that allows some additional leverage for the debtor, the person that owes the money that is living on the property or otherwise owes the mortgage. It allows them an opportunity to have a second chance to negotiate something 
with their landlord or a second opportunity to otherwise deal with their mortgage company through the tools that are given in the bankruptcy process. In reality, some of the bankruptcy judges have also just been taking their time and giving companies, you know, months in, in, in the premises to figure things out. So when, if you're dealing with a, generally when you file, you have about 60 days to cure, uh, you have 60 days within which you have to assume or reject the contract. Um, and that's a, a very generous period of time to figure out how you're going to proceed. It gives you some breathing room and it gives you an opportunity to go to your landlord and deal with that landlord and figure out how are, are we going to get back with the relationship or are we not, in which case we're going to reject that contract and figure out an alternative solution uh, potentially across the street in a much more advanta financially advantageous lease. Um, proverbially. Because, without, because if you don't file for bankruptcy, you only have a matter of days. Correct. Correct. Ordinarily, it, without the moratoriums in place. But once these moratoriums are lifted, it, it's, it's going to be literally like a tidal wave. And so unless people have a plan in place, they could, they could just be, be wiped out by, by, by this wave. And so bankruptcy is going to give them that chance of that life raft to try and come up with, with a solution, you know, even though it, it, it's 60 days or, nine, or whatever it might be. I, I, you, pointed to, you, you pointed and touched on it. I think what, really what we're defining here is time. And what we're providing is an ability to have whether an extra week or two weeks or three weeks, some additional oxygen in the form of time to be able to do something else and repivot and try to find an additional solution to the problem. Uh, you know, we have a few questions here. Uh, do you think that this is the end of brick and mortar or what will happen to, to you know, to real estate, you know, what, what will happen to, to, to brick and mortar? What do I think? Yeah. Um, I don't, I think that uh, the, I'll start off with traditional retail brick and mortar. I think that it's not going to put the death knell in brick and mortar. Those that require brick and mortar as part of their model, it will, they'll continue. I, I think it's just in a much more downsized fashion. I don't think that you're going to see the large retail establishments like a JCPenney department store style. I, I think that that's on its way down out of this world uh, as a model. Um, as for uh, office space, I think that that model there's divergent views on this. Some say that as soon as the vaccine is out and folks can come back to normalcy, uh, office, normal office life will continue. Um, my view is different that this has shown a large segment of many companies out there that they could do business differently in a much more lean and efficient manner, uh, which means that office footprint will reduce itself, naturally speaking. I've spoken to a few people that have already uh, went out there and either renegotiated their lease, terminated their lease, their office lease, uh, with the idea that they want to do things differently. Um, no, I, I think that is the future. I mean, I think there will be a place for brick and mortar office. It's just going to be different in terms of how it was in the past and that people will be working more from home and from other places and, and that our nature of work and, and, and living space is going to converge to, to, to some extent as, as we proceed. I want to talk to you about subchapter five in a chapter 11. We've talked about that and we have just a few minutes left, but it's a really important subject for small and mid-sized businesses. And I want to, want to emphasize how important that is in terms of what you do and what, what we do every day. So go ahead. Sure. Um, I'm glad that you mentioned it. So um, for those of you who are not aware, uh, August of 2019, Congress passed a, uh, a new law under called the Small Business Reorganization Act. It was part of the Farm Bill. It went into effect February of 19th, uh, 2020. Um, and uh, sorry, <laughs> something switched on the screen for me. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, it went into effect February of 19th, 2020. Um, it's a new law that um, is based on the traditional reorganization regiment that the bankruptcy, court, uh, bankruptcy code provided. It just created a new type of chapter 11 reorganization that's more tailored for small businesses. And what they said, what Congress said, is we recognize that the costs of running a reorganization for a corporation are exorbitant. Uh, the process takes a long time and it's not tailored for the small business. So let's do something about it. And what they did is this thing called the Small Business Reorganization Act, which is now codified as subchapter V under the chapter 11 uh, regimen. And 
what it does is it removes certain costs. It makes the whole process fast. And when I say fast, I mean within 90 days, you're expected to file a plan that shows how you're going to reorganize, what you're going to do with respect to this business. Um, it also um, allowed for additional uh, benefits to the debtor in giving the debtor more leverage um, as part of their bankruptcy case. And what do I mean by more leverage? It um, allowed for the debtor that is still operating themselves to reduce the value of secured loans. There are loans that are backed by assets, reduce the amount of that loan to the value of the assets. And while beforehand under the old 11, chapter 11, you could do that, you required a percentage vote that was a complex formula. I'm not gonna go into it as to how to get that passed as part of your plan. But now under the new subchapter five, it allows for a streamlined process where you may need the vote to just as a, are we in favor or not in favor? But even if your creditors are not in favor, you could still theoretically get a plan approved. Whereas under the old regime, chapter 11 regime, you couldn't. Now who qualifies for this Small Business Reorganization Act? Roy, do you know? Uh, I, I forgot what the exact numbers are, but it's with businesses that, that have uh, a debt owned under a certain million dollar number. Correct. So um, in order to qualify for a small business reorganization, the debts have to be a business mostly, majority of which business in nature for a business. An individual can also take advantage of a small business reorganization. That's why I'm saying the majority of the debt has to be business in nature. Um, but also, the maximum amount was initially set at $2.725 million. But as part of the pandemic and uh, the CARES Act, if you all recall, there was a $2.2 trillion uh, law that came into effect sometime in April. Congress quickly realized that we have this new tool. Why not allow more small businesses to benefit by increasing the maximum allowable debt? And what what, they what's did, the new number now? What's it now? The new number? 7.5 million, right, right. but right. there's a big but. And the but is that 7.5 million total aggregate debt is only gonna be there for the next, I guess, uh, 10 months. I mean, it was for 12 months. So right. wherever we are right now. So there's not many more months that people can take advantage of it. It could be that Congress will uh, extend it that's a political question. Yeah, I, I, I sense it will be extended probably a few times over the next few years. I mean, the reality, and correct me if I'm wrong, and then we have to go, is that, is that historically these, sub five, these, these chapter 11s for small businesses were not terribly successful, and that 70% of the time the businesses did not survive. The creditors would just be almost vindictive and want to pull whatever they could get, and they didn't give a sh you know, two hoots about, about the employees, the people, the history of the company, the services the company was providing to the community. And so now I think Congress is saying, no, there's a bigger policy issue. We need to keep these businesses intact. We need to keep them in place. And that's going to be a double and triple down since 60 to 70 percent of small businesses probably are going to get wiped out. As we're seeing these large businesses are being wiped out. I mean, we're going to see even more small businesses wiped out. And so we're going to see the bankruptcy code being used as a social tool to try and keep businesses in place, to try and keep the employees in place and to try and keep you know, this economy going. And I think in the long run, it's important to keep these, these businesses that, that, that create the community and, and create a culture of, of an environment to, to keep those, those folks in, in, in place. And I know that uh, you and I are going to be very busy between uh, the increased foreclosures that are going to have to be defended, the increased foreclosures that are going to cause more foreclosures, the evictions we're going to have to stop, uh, and at the same time trying to help some creditors and lenders on occasion who also have to deal with these issues. And, and no one's been immune to this. And that's why, Ido, I want to thank you so very much for joining us today and why we will be back next week at Zoom, and, Zoom at Noon number 24 as, uh, once again, Oppenheim Law and Weston Title uh, continue to sponsor this, uh, this event until such time that no one finds it necessary. And I can't wait till that day arrives, but until then, we will be here and we, we look forward to your support, Ido, as well as Zach, so your partner and everyone else, of course, who has joined us today. So thank you very much again. Roy Oppenheim, Zoom at noon. See you next week for number 24. Have a great week. Thank you.